Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. The words of that familiar acclamation are not just for Easter Sunday. Uh, we are in the Easter season. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this morning service uh, from the Church of St. Philip and St. James in Hollywood for this Sunday, the 26th of April, 2020. One of the key themes of our service today, which will link uh, throughout uh, the service, is the idea of hope. A Christian hope always has a large quantity of confidence within it. We are confident of God's grace as we come to him in an opening prayer, uh, which is a prayer of confession. Please join me in the responses on the screen. Lord God, you raised your son from the dead. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, through you, we are more than conquerors. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Holy Spirit, you help us in our weakness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. As we continue now in worship, united in faith, we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. After our opening music, in just a moment, the rest of our service will be led this morning by my colleague, the Reverend Ken McGrath. And on this Sunday, when we think about Jesus opening the eyes of his disciples uh, through sharing God's word with them. We hear our opening music today from our choristers. They sing for us the Reverend Peter Skellern's Waiting for the Word. morning and our thanks there to the choristers uh, reminding us to wait for the word and it is now that we uh, come to our bible reading this morning and our, our reading will be given to us by Drew Wilkinson and it comes from the 24th chapter in the book the gospel indeed of Luke it's the well-known encounter on the Emmaus Road. The reading is taken from Luke 
chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked of each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Many of you will know that I am something of a rugby fan, uh, but this kind of story can happen in any sport. A friend of ours went to see his beloved Tottenham Hotspur uh, play against Arsenal at the Emirates Stadium in 2008. Things started off very well. Uh, Spurs went 1-0 up, but late in the game, uh, they found themselves 4-2 down. And my friend, who wasn't too sure of the local tube station and his way around, decided he was going to have to reluctantly leave. He headed off to his hotel where he rejoined his wife. And he said, well, that was a waste of time. Uh, To which she replied, but sure, it was a great game. The reality was that Tottenham had come back and got those two late goals. And at the very end of the game, clinched uh, a four-all draw. He had gone without knowing the whole story and left very dejected because of it. Maybe you have your own experiences of basing your decision on not knowing all the facts. That's really what we discover in Luke chapter 24 this morning. We meet and ironically Jesus meets two very disappointed disciples trudging out of Jerusalem trying to process all the experiences of the previous week. And they are hopeless. We know that one of them was called Cleopas. We aren't told whether they're friends or a couple. And we don't know much about them at all. Except that they hadn't yet discovered the reality of the resurrection. The important thing to note is that they had been told about it. They tell the one who joins them on the road, unknowing who that is, that some of their friends had gone searching for Jesus' body and not finding it, had been told by the angels that Jesus was alive. Of course, the empty tomb is the evidence of the resurrection, but it was not enough in itself to restore their hope. And it is not a substitute for meeting with the living Jesus himself, which is what Luke is at pains to tell us in his gospel. Hope is vitally important in life. And as we've reflected over these last few weeks in our parish, 
We've used a phrase throughout this pandemic crisis, which is simply living in hope. I'm very pleased this morning to introduce a couple of parishioners who are doing just that. I've asked Mary, one of our church wardens, and Dahi, who is a ministry apprentice in a parish in County Cavan, to share a little of what Christian hope means to them, and also some of their personal hopes for when this current crisis is over. I would be lying if I told you I hadn't felt real fear at this time, because I have. Before lockdown, I was going back and forth to a bustling primary school where social distancing wasn't feasible. I felt unable to protect my house and my home from the virus. But when that fear woke me in the middle of the night, without the distraction of tasks and signs, I faced it, only to realise that I am not afraid of death. To say my hope is in Christ sounds like a cliché learnt in childhood, but neither of these things detract from its truth. This realisation, this hope is a great comfort to me. But what of loss? Surely the fear of loss drowns out fear. Looking back at my life, it has been times of impending or actual loss when I felt the tangible presence of Christ the most. And now, if I feel that faith has become lukewarm, it is in the memory of these times that I draw. Times of suffering without doubt, but times of blessing that arise from a dependency on God. I use a prayer app recommended by my fellowship group. A refrain in the daily prayer says, I choose to rejoice. And I do. When I rejoice, I am filled with love for God and I'm open to love from God. Love drives out fear. Psalm 131 says, My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quietened my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. My hope for the immediate time after this is simple. I have lived off Church Road since I was 10 and I never tire of walking down it to the lock. I look forward to dandering from the dirty duck to the yacht club and back, with Terry by my side. Listening out for curlews and oyster catchers, watching out for red shanks and perhaps even some pale-bellied Brentwood geese. Chatting to friends and strangers alike, making a fuss of their dogs, and all without keeping my distance, turning my face or approaching corners with caution. And if there's an ice cream van at Sea Park, all the better. I'll queue patiently for my 99, find a bench, and take my time eating it. Hello, everyone. Uh, for me, this hope means uh, there's two things I would like to say. There's that Jesus is the king, and that Jesus has truly saved me. Uh, so that Jesus is king. He, uh, he went from death to life. He rose again, and he has authority over all things. Um, he's the king over all things in our lives. He's the king over uh, the good things in our lives and he's king over the difficult times of our lives as well. Uh, he's even the king over things like global pandemics and it's, uh, it's amazing to know that he is in control over all these things, even the scary things. And, uh, and that Jesus has saved me. Uh, Jesus saved me from when I was running away from him, from uh, when I turn away from him. Uh, he has saved me from those things. He's brought me from death to life and he's brought me into his perfect freedom and uh, brought me into his full eternal life. And it's, it's an amazing hope to have um, 
that security, to have that knowledge of security that I am in him and uh, nothing can take me out of his hands, out of the hands of my my loving King Jesus. Um, for things that I would like to do once this lockdown is over, I think number one on my list would be to get a haircut. Uh, my hair just kind of grows up and outwards and it's uh, getting a bit more difficult to manage as you might be able to see. Um, <laughs> the other thing I would like to do once this lockdown is over, uh, I usually work in in County Cavan in the Diocese of Kilmore as a church intern in the drum group of churches and uh, it's uh, everything's moved online uh, for our ministry but it's uh, it's it's good but it's not the same and I'm looking forward to actually uh, seeing the people that I usually work with and all the, the young people in the schools and all those different things um, I'm very much looking forward to getting back to to normal ministry and uh, to, to normal life being able to see people again. Thank you to Mary and to Danny. 99s and a good haircut are things to be hopeful in. I imagine many of us uh, might share those same kinds of hope. On Easter Sunday past, we marvelled at the good news of the resurrection story. But also we pondered the mystery of Jesus' newness and the fact that Mary Magdalene didn't recognise him at first. Two disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't recognise Jesus either. But we know why. Because Luke tells us that they were specifically kept from recognising Jesus on their encounter with him. You can find that remarkable statement in verse 16. It must have been for a reason. And I think it is so that we learn a lesson about how we too, millennia later, can come to know the risen Jesus too. We don't meet him in a garden or on the road. But Cleopas and their companions say this. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And the whole story, the whole story says he has. I love the fact that they think that Jesus is the one who doesn't know what's going on. It is at least gently comical. And we know there is a happy ending for them to come. Jesus sits down and shows them the whole story. They hadn't believed the witnesses, their friends, the second-hand report of the angels. They needed to wrestle with the truth of the living Jesus in a different way. So they were treated to what must have been one of the world's greatest ever Bible study. These people who don't know the whole story are given the whole story by Jesus. As they make their journey, he takes them on a journey through the whole Bible, that is the Old Testament, explaining how he fulfills it. And as they arrive at their destination, they arrive too at the greatest truth in the world. As Jesus breaks bread with them, as he reenacts those actions so familiar to us from the Last Supper. Some people have speculated that perhaps they saw the wounds in Jesus' hands as he broke the bread. But Luke leaves that to the imagination. Their eyes were opened and they recognised him, he says. Their meal with Jesus leaves them with the best heartburn ever. The scriptures are witnesses to Jesus. The sacrament of Holy Communion is a witness to Jesus. And in that special time with Jesus, they have their eyes opened. They recognise and acknowledge him. Mary and Dahi have made my job this morning very easy because they have told us where we find our hope in the reality of the person of Jesus, in the good news of God's word of comfort and power. We have hope because of who God is in Christ. We encounter the Lord through the sacraments. How we are looking forward to that opportunity once again. We encounter the hope of the Lord through the church, through the body of Christ, the people around us. For many of the people, their encounter with Jesus happens just like this, a gradual realization of the integrity of God's word. 
and the living worship life of the church. As I close, here are some of my hopes. Not just to see Ulster play rugby again at Ravenhill. I'm also looking forward to the time when we can study God's word together. I'm looking forward to the time when we can break bread together face to face in the unique fellowship of communion. There may be lots of unknowns in our circumstances today. There's much for all of us to discover too in the grace of God providing for us. But when it comes to the risen Jesus, we do know the whole story, the important truth of a living hope in a living Lord. I'm delighted now to introduce a piece of music by an artist called Lauren Daigle. This is a recording made at a baptism service uh, last year. Thank you to Joy and to Grace and to Simon as they bring us uh, this piece. You say, I am. You'll appreciate the powerful affirmation given in this song. From song to prayer, let us move to our morning prayer versicles and responses, and then Reverend Canon Jim Sims uh, will lead us in our prayers of intercession. First of all, those versicles and responses. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen and grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people and bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord, 
and let your glory be over all the earth. O God, make clean our hearts within us and renew us by your Holy Spirit. And now over to Canon Sims, who will lead us further in our prayers. The Collect for the Third Sunday of Easter. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us such knowledge of his presence with us, that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually with righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And in these difficult times, we remember before God all our loved ones near and far. We pray for them and for our community. Almighty and all-loving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we pray to you through Christ the Healer for those who suffer from the coronavirus here in Ireland and across the world. We pray too for all who mourn the loss of each and every person who has died as a result of contracting the disease. Give wisdom to policy makers, skill to healthcare professionals and researchers. Give comfort to everyone in distress and a sense of calm to us all in these uncertain days. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who showed compassion to the outcast, acceptance to the rejected, and love to those to whom no love was shown. Amen. A little prayer poem for these days. God bless you in these anxious days and prosper all you do, giving you grace for each day's task and strength to see it through. Take all the joy there is in sunshine and in showers. Tomorrow's in the hands of God. Today alone is ours. Then let the future rest with him. Every anxious care, you'll find that as you journey on, He's with you everywhere. Amen. In the Anglican circle of prayer, we're asked today to remember before God the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem and the Middle East. For Archbishop Michael Lewis, his clergy and people at this time. We pray also for the Order of St John Eye Hospital in the Holy City of Jerusalem. Near home we pray God's blessing at this time on our Bishop, Bishop David, and all the Maclay family following the recent death of David's father in Donegal. In our diocesan prayer cycle, we pray for the parish of Clonallan on Warren Point with Kilbrony, for the rector, Bishop Darren McCartney, and his people. And a prayer for the church here in Ireland. Almighty and merciful God, who in days of old didst give to this land the benediction of thy holy church. Withdraw not, we pray thee, thy favour from us, but so correct what is amiss and supply what is lacking, that we may more and more bring forth fruit to thy glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And finally, we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our thanks to Canon Sims for leading us in our prayers this morning. Before we move on, let me just give a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one concerning the Bible study. Uh, that's on a Monday evening at 7.30. And all the details about logging in uh, can be found on the parish website. And as well, uh, we are looking forward to having another prayer meeting on Wednesday evening. Again, that will be 7.30. And again, the information to log in can be found on the parish website. Indeed, the parish website is very helpful. And uh, there you will have lots of information, not least phone numbers uh, for myself and Gareth and others in the staff. And if you would like to ring us concerning anything where you think we might help, uh, be a help to you, then please do not hesitate to give us a call. And now we move on to our closing hymn. It is the all-encompassing composition by Jan Strutter, and it is Lord of All, Hopeful, all Hopefulness. <laughs> We close this morning with the Easter benediction, followed by our organ voluntary, voluntary by C.S. Lang's Tuba Tunes. And so our Easter benediction. God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, raise you up to walk with him in the newness of his risen life. And the blessing of God Almighty the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>